Raphael Devers owns the New York Yankees. The young stud continued to shine once again as he crushed two home runs on back-to-back days in a series over the weekend in which the Red Sox swept the Yankees in the Bronx. You are Locked On Red Sox, your daily Boston Red Sox podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Red Sox, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Gabby Hurlbut, former ESPN social media associate and current host of the Boston Balling Podcast, here to bring you the latest in all things Boston Red Sox, Monday through Friday, straight to your favorite podcast feed on the show where we sometimes freak out in a good way and sometimes freak out in a bad way. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONMLB for $20 off your first purchase. Last-minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Welcome to another episode of the show. Don't forget, you can get Locked on Red Sox straight to your favorite podcast feed Monday through Friday. You can also catch the home broadcast of every Red Sox game on Sirius XM. Just download the Sirius XM app and search Red Sox, and they will have you covered with the home broadcast for all Red Sox games, so you won't have to miss a single pitch. Raphael Devers owns the Yankees. It's as simple as that. I mean, the kid continues to mash, particularly in the Bronx, and hit all kinds of records again in this weekend series, so I will be diving into that, as well as Talking about just what happened in the weekend series in Sunday's game, just a lot of chaos that went on. So I'm going to try to make sense of some of that, as well as go briefly into Jaron Duran's injury and what it means for the Red Sox moving forward. So hope you're having a great start to the week. The Red Sox made that easy for us, sweeping the Yankees once again for the second time this year. They did it once at Fenway earlier in the season. They now did it at Yankee Stadium. I mean, the Red Sox have been absolutely dominant against New York this year. The Yankees have only been able to win one single game against the Red Sox this season. And that's pretty insane when you think about it. Just how good the Yankees were last year and really just seeing the downfall from the last year to now they can't hit their pitching is shaky particularly their starting pitching and that's just been so beneficial for the Red Sox who really needed that series after a rough previous series in DC against the Nationals in a series which they really should have been able to win and they didn't So to be able to come out with not only a series win, but also a sweep against the Red Sox rivals is pretty nice and a good feeling. But one of the biggest reasons for the Red Sox sweeping the Yankees once again is because of the young stud, Raphael Devers. We all know him. We all love him. He's going to be here for another 11 years in Boston, which is awesome. He just really knows how to hit the baseball at Yankee Stadium. He's hitting 520 in the Bronx this year. He went three for four on Friday, three for five on Saturday with a home run, and three for four on Sunday with a home run. He always hits well at Yankee Stadium, but he has 23 home runs versus the Yankees currently which is actually the second most homers versus the Yankees among active major league players. Um, He's in good company. He joined an elite group of players as one of the few Red Sox players to have had multiple 29 plus home run seasons before turning 27. He'll be 27 in October. He has three seasons in which he's had multiple 29 plus home run seasons, which is pretty good. Um, Players who have had at least one with the Red Sox are Xander Bogarts, Mookie Betts, Nomar Garcia-Para, Jim Rice, Mo Vaughn, Babe Ruth. I mean, we're talking absolute legends here. All of these players have had at least 
one 29 plus home run season before turning 27. So it's crazy that Devers has three of those tacked on a couple more home runs in the weekend series. Um, he also joined another group on Sunday being one of the few MLB players with 23 plus home runs against the Yankees before turning 27. The players on this list entail Jimmy Fox with 39 Rocky Calavito with 26, ironically, A-Rod with 25, and then Devers with 23. So it's a really elite group of players who have hit 23 or more home runs against the Yankees before turning 27 years old. His 23rd home run was on Sunday. I mean, how do you not love Devers? I think there's been a lot of expectations for him this season because he just signed that massive extension with the team and we all want him to perform well and as fans naturally we're going to expect him to produce now that he is the face of the franchise and he's had a little bit of an up and down season he's had some cold stretches at the plate he's had some hot streaks but he's so comfortable at Yankee Stadium and the Devers that we saw this weekend in the series feels like the Devers of old the devers that we're used to seeing the devers that they offer that big contract extension to the one that can hit for power and really be productive when the red sox need him to be and he just kept hitting and hitting and for a good chunk of the game on sunday the red sox were unable to get their bats going but devers reached in his first three at bats and he was actually on cycle watch because He hit a home run, he singled, he hit a double. So I was hoping he would get that triple too. But he was the only one really producing any kind of offense for a good portion of the game. And I'm going to dive into more of what really happened in the game coming up. But Devers needs to channel his inner Yankee Stadium in every game moving forward because he's obviously so comfortable playing there. He's found a lot of success there ever since his rookie season, really. I mean, I'll never forget that home run he hit off Chapman in the ninth inning at Yankee Stadium in 2017, his rookie season, and just how far he's come since then. And the fact that he just continues to rip apart the Yankees And even on Saturday, going deep once again, he needs to continue that. I'm hoping that the fact that they went to Yankee Stadium and played against pitchers he's familiar with will just continue to trigger some more confidence from him because if the Red Sox really want to fight for a playoff spot down the road here in this final 40 games of the season, they're going to need him to be this version of Devers. and. Sometimes it takes players playing in a place that they're comfortable with to get themselves back on track. And I can only hope that that's what it will be for Devers because he's on an absolute roll right now. He's just finding the ball really well. He's approaching the plate really well. And he just is really channeling the Devers that we all know and love as Red Sox fans, the Devers that opposing pitchers are afraid to face the hitter that pitchers feel like they have to intentionally walk like they did with him on Sunday and ultimately and ended up backfiring on the Yankees. But that hitter that when it comes down to it and it's crunch time, opposing pitchers don't want Devers to step foot at the plate. And that's how he was playing at Yankee stadium. And hopefully that can continue because we need that version of Devers. So coming up, I'm going to be diving into what else happened in Sunday's game. It was kind of a wild one, but let's hope that this is a turning point for Devers and that he can really just push forward and just be full force foot on the gas in the last month or so of the season. We've all been in pinches where we decide last minute that we want tickets to an event. I've done it recently. I bought tickets for one of my best friends for her birthday to a country concert in Boston in September. And I was trying to find the right tickets for the right price. And game time had me covered 
they are no stress. You don't have to worry about the last minute scramble because it really shouldn't be stressful buying tickets to your favorite event. It should be more exciting. Game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. With killer deals on last minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for the fun you'll have. Snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked on MLB for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked on MLB for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Game Time really is the place for you. I highly encourage you to go to them. They will make the ticket process so much less stressful. So what happened on Sunday? I mean, that game was an absolute roller coaster of emotions from start to finish. The Red Sox started on a high with Devers hitting the home run and just feeling like, oh, Devers is back and it was great. And then, you know, Winkowski comes in and pitches an inning and he looks totally fine. He walked Judge, but was able to retire the other three batters that he faced. And then I was looking forward to Pavetta pitching because bullpen Nick Pavetta has just been phenomenal this year. And, you know, he was doing okay. And then gives up a home run to the Yankees nine hitter, Higashioka. I mean, you can't be giving up home runs to nine hitters. And especially a catcher. I mean, Pavetta has been playing so well, but that was just such a non-opportune time to give up that home run. And ultimately, it tied the game. And every time the Red Sox would go ahead, the Yankees would just come back with a home run to tie the game. I mean, for example, in the top of the sixth inning, the Red Sox took a two-to-one lead. Ultimately, the Red Sox got a little bit lucky because Yoshida grounded into a fielder's choice. And then there was a throwing error by Volpe to first base. He just had a really bad throw. So Devers ended up scoring on it. And I was like, I'll happily take that because the Red Sox bats were a little silent up until then after the Devers home run. So I was fine with taking that because we, you know, Sometimes you get lucky in baseball. And then, of course, the Yankees come back and tie it again in the bottom of the sixth inning. Glaber Torres smashes a home run to make it two to two. And I'm like, you've seriously got to be kidding me right now. Like, I'm riding this high because the Red Sox take the lead. And then Torres just comes back and just has to be that guy to tie the game again. It was so frustrating. But then, you know, my frustration only lasted a half inning because Mr. Clutch just comes up big again in the top of the seventh inning. This man has been the Red Sox most consistent hitter, especially in the clutch when they need somebody to come up big in pressure situations and get that big hit for the Red Sox. So ultimately... Reese McGuire walked and they brought in Connor Wong to pinch run, which I absolutely love because that's an absolute upgrade in speed. And then Pablo Reyes laid down a very beautiful bunt as a sacrifice to get McGuire into scoring position. Um, And obviously, you know, it makes sense then having Wong come in. So that was all fine. And then they decided to intentionally walk Devers, which, I don't blame them at all because at this point there were two outs. Alex Verdugo had popped out. And, you know, if I'm the Yankees and I'm seeing the way that Devers hits against my team, I'm intentionally walking the guy too. But guess who comes up and makes him pay is Justin Turner comes up and says, oh, yeah, you want to intentionally walk my guy? I got you. Rips a three-run home run, 398 feet to put the Red Sox up five to two. And I was so pumped because I was like, thank you. You are Mr. Clutch. He was Mr. Clutch again in the ninth inning. He hit a go-ahead double to score Pablo Reyes, and the Red Sox ultimately won the game 6-5. So Justin Turner really is that guy every time who – 
will give the Red Sox the lead or tie it when they need a hitter to come up and be absolutely super clutch. I always can count on Justin Turner to do that, and he did do that twice in the game. So I am a huge fan of Justin Turner. I've made it so clear, and he ultimately won the game for the Red Sox. But there was some funkiness that happened in there leading up to that. You know, John Schreiber came in, and after coming off the injured list, he hasn't been the absolute lights-out John Schreiber that we saw last year. He's been good. But by no means has he been great. He came in in the bottom of the seventh inning and threw two-thirds of an inning, giving up two hits and three earned runs because, of course, he gave up a three-run homer to Volpe to tie the game 5-5 to right after Justin Turner went yard to put the Red Sox up by three runs. I mean, talk about an emotional roller coaster. I was on a high from the Turner home run and then go all the way back down to a low when Schreiber gives up the three-run homer. And then after the three-run homer, he walked Higashioka. So he was just really struggling to record outs um, in the inning. Ended up also walking Glaber Torres before getting pulled because Cora – said, I can't do this anymore. So he brought in Bernardino and um, John Carlos Stanton came in to pinch hit and Bernardino got the out, got Stanton to fly out. So that was a good decision. Schreiber just did not have it on Sunday. He very much looked like he was struggling, did not have command of the plate, could not record outs. I mean, the first three hitters either reached base or scored. He gave up an infield single. He then gave up a walk and then gave up the three-run homer. And then Higashioka walked after that. So he went through four batters before he recorded the first out of the inning. So that was incredibly stressful and frustrating. Um, It was just not his outing. I'm not going to jump to conclusions and say he's not good because he has been pretty good this season. But it was just not his day. And then... You know, some more action happened in the bottom of the eighth inning. The Yankees almost took the lead in the game. So basically, IKF singled to right. And then Harrison Bader recorded an out and McKinney flied out and that was fine. So IKF was on first and there were two outs. And then Volpe just hit a single to left. It wasn't even hit that hard. But Rep Snyder tripped and fell on the play. So ultimately that slowed down his ability to throw the ball in. So he did throw the ball in, but Kiner Falefa thought it was a good idea to round the bases and went all the way home and slid into home. And at first they called him safe. And I said, wow, he just scored from third or he just scored from first on a single. Are you kidding me? So they ruled him safe and the Red Sox challenged the play. And then ultimately he ended up being called out. But Connor Wong was standing there, made the tag on Kiner Falefa. When the Red Sox challenged the play and they then ruled that he was out, the Yankees then challenged the same play to see if it was um, catcher's interference, like if he was blocking the plate. Um, During the play, during all of these replays, when they were showing all of this and trying to explain it on the Nesson broadcast, I was sitting there like, I don't think they're going to overturn this play. It could go either way. It's close. There were angles that I was seeing where it looked like the tag beat his foot, but I could have seen an argument for him sliding in and his foot getting there before Wong's tag. So I said, I don't think there's a way they overturn this. I think, you know, he looks like he could be out, but it just doesn't seem like enough evidence. So I was absolutely shocked when they overturned the play. My mouth literally dropped. And so then that happened. And then I don't blame the Yankees for challenging the same play because I probably would have done the same thing to see if Connor Wong was blocking the plate because he was standing Giving the runner a base path, you have to give the runner a clear path to be able to score, which he was doing. But then because the throw took him 
to where he had to go to make the play, which was right in front of the plate, he was allowed to do that. So ultimately they had to look at whether he gave kind of Falefa a clear path to run home, which he did. And then the throw came in. And when the throw came in, it caused him to have to move himself over and place himself in front of the plate in order to make the play. And that is allowed. If the play requires you to move in front, you're allowed to do it. So they checked that and realized everything that he did was legal. So therefore they ruled IKF out and that was the end of the inning. And that ended up being huge for the Red Sox because they took away the Yankees go ahead home run to then allow Turner to, to um, drive in the go ahead ultimately ended up win it being winning run in the ninth inning. So it was a very confusing play and a lot to unpack, but that's essentially what happened. What Connor Wong did was legal because he wasn't intentionally planting himself right in front of the plate to the point where the runner had no clear path to get there. It was because the throw came to a spot where he had to position himself there to make the play and that's legal. So they overturned it ended up being the right call from all the replays I saw after the fact, and it ended up working out for the Red Sox because they then won the game in the ninth inning. Kenley Jansen still stresses me out. I mean, he gave up a couple base runners in the ninth inning. When you have a one-run lead like that, it never feels safe. But Jansen's given me some near heart attacks this season. I mean, gave up a leadoff double in the inning and then hit DJ LeMahieu with a pitch. And I was like, great, here we go. So now the first two runners have hit with Aaron Judge coming to the plate. Um, and then Judge struck out. So I started feeling a little bit more relieved. And then Jansen recorded the next couple outs. So he was able to get the job done. But my heart was pounding in the entire bottom of the ninth inning because that man just stresses me out. And I, you know, have always appreciated Kenley Jansen for the pitcher he is and his career accolades, but I was so nervous he was going to blow that. And lastly, the officiating in the series, in the game on Sunday, was brutal. I mean, on both sides, that ump at home plate just had a really, really weird strike zone that I could not figure it out at all. Alex Cora ended up getting tossed because he was arguing a called strike three to Trevor Story that was off the plate. And Story kind of put himself in that position because he did swing at the pitch prior to that, which was well off the plate and would have been ball four. But that still is beside the point because the one they called a strike that he was looking at should have also been ball four. And there were just a lot of calls like that throughout the game. I mean, there was a point earlier on in the game where Pavetta threw a pitch and it was right down the middle to the point where even the batter was starting to head back towards the dugout because he felt like he had just struck out and the ump didn't say anything. So then he had to come back because it was clearly a strike. So, but the ump didn't think so. So there were multiple, you know, calls that were questionable and it went both ways. I mean, in the ninth inning, that strike three call to judge arguably might not have been a strike. It was close. It might've hit the corner, but it looked a little bit inside to me. So that ump was all over the place, just not good officiating, but overall great series sweep for the Red Sox. I wish they could just play the Yankees all the time. Just absolutely have to keep winning games. This next 10 day stretch with the Astros Dodgers and then Astros again coming up are going to be absolutely huge to determine if the Red Sox are an average team or a team that can compete for a true, um, you know, playoff spot because we've seen too much of this up and down this season. They've played well against good teams, but they have not played well against bad teams. And they've been very, very up and down to the point where they feel like a 500 team. But if they can come out of this next 10 day stretch and win a good chunk of those games, they have a legitimate chance at making the playoffs. But these series here coming up, this to me arguably is the most important stretch of the season because they really just need to lock in and win these games because if they if they can't figure it out and win these games, then they'll finish around 500 and will not make the postseason. So we'll see what happens, but hopefully they can continue to keep it rolling.
Coming up, I just want to briefly talk about Jaron Duran and the little mini injury that he suffered during Sunday's game and kind of what it means going forward. Don't forget, you can check out Locked on Red Sox on your favorite podcast platform Monday through Friday. New episodes daily on the Boston Red Sox featuring special guests, hot takes, crossover episodes with other Locked on podcast hosts, and just a mix of a lot of different things, but new content every day straight to your feed. You also don't have to miss a single pitch of Red Sox baseball with the SiriusXM app. Just download SiriusXM and search Red Sox, and you can catch the Nesson broadcast for every Red Sox game so you don't have to worry about missing a pitch and you can stay up to date. I know that's what I like to do. Also, don't forget that you can check out other Locked On shows as well. We have a wide variety of shows and very talented people who host all these shows. So don't forget to check those out. Follow me on Twitter at Gabby Hurlbutt 10 and follow the show on Twitter at LO underscore Red Sox and continue the conversation that way because it's always a great time hearing from other people and what they have to say about the team. So Jaron Duran suffered a mini injury during Sunday's game. Um, he was replaced by Ref Snyder in the eighth inning of Sunday's game. Um, ultimately, it actually was because of something that happened a few innings prior to that. He had a left toe contusion, and it happened in the sixth inning when he tried to climb the left field wall on a home run by Glaber Torres. And it was obviously bothering him, so they pulled him from the game. Um, Alex Cora, after the game, didn't seem too concerned about it. He said, you know, Duran was feeling it, but they're just going to see where he's at today. Um, the, you know, report is that they don't expect it to be anything that would likely require him to miss a lot of time, which if that ends up being the case would be super important because then I really would just say, you know, this team is cursed. This season is cursed because just as they're getting healthy, Duran going down for an extended period of time would just be a huge blow to this team. So it's a huge relief that it doesn't appear like that's going to be the case. Um, so Cora just said they're going to see how he feels today, which is good. Um, luckily, the Red Sox do have the outfield depth between Yoshida Verdugo, Duval, they could call up an outfielder from AAA if need be um, to get some time. Willier Abreu is an option um, who's been having a good season in AAA and could be an option to replace Duran temporarily if he has to go on the IL. But I'm hoping that it's nothing too serious, as Cora is indicating, and he might need a day or two to rest. But hopefully he'll be back in the lineup as soon as possible because the Red Sox cannot afford to lose another player to injury when it really feels like they're finally starting to get things together as much as they can. You know, obviously the Yankees have not had a good season, so beating them doesn't say the Red Sox are just this super good baseball team. But Sunday's win really felt like a huge win for momentum I know that the team had a big celebration in the locker room after the game. And it's more to me about that energy and the momentum that they can now carry into what's going to be a tough stretch in their schedule. If they had lost on Sunday, it would have been an absolutely demoralizing loss. So the fact that they were able to pull the win off and the sweep, it really felt like it was a different kind of energy. And it felt like that game could be the turning point in terms of the make or break of, is this team serious? Can they make a run this year or not? Um, so just got to keep that momentum going into these next three series. These are going to be the deciding factor for the 2023 Boston Red Sox. It will either be their downfall or their message that they're sending of we're here and we can compete this year. So got to buckle down. Ideally, I'd love to see them take three of four in Houston, but I'll be okay with a split and then just, full force foot on the gas for the rest of the season, but especially these next few series against the Astros, Dodgers, and then Astros again. Keep the faith as always. I encourage you go Red Sox as usual. Don't forget to download the Sirius XM app, type in Red Sox, catch the home broadcast for every Red Sox game. I will catch you on the flip side.